Um, I got back to Apple along with several other people uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, what we found was uh, a great company that needed a little bit of help. And um, during this time, I've been the interim CEO. But I'm uh, pleased to announce today that I'm going to drop the interim title. <laughs> Plus minute Apple conversation you're going to hear all week long. My name is Arafan Elijah, and I'm joined by two to three of the sexiest members of the international ribboning dance troupe. Leander Caney is here. Welcome, Leander. <laughs> <laughs> the ribboning leader himself. Uh, Buster Hein is here. Buster. Good, good afternoon. And at any moment. At any moment, Alex Excelsior Heath will be joining us. He is busy restarting his router because his audio sounded like poop. So he'll be joining in any moment. Welcome to the Cult Cast, everybody. Lots of stuff to talk about this week. We're going to be talking about Steve Jobs. The uh, anniversary of his death is o- October 5th. Can you guys believe it's already been almost three years? It feels like it just happened. Um, so I would thought we would start with a cool little uh, bit about him and uh, how he helped train Apple to deal with situations like Bengate, which has been crazier than I think anyone has ever expected. Mm. And uh, we're also going to be talking about another new addition to Apple. And uh, I finally have my uh, hands on an iPhone 6 Plus, and I've been using it for a week. And I want to give you guys uh, my uh, impressions. And I want to hear what you guys think now that you've been using yours for a couple of weeks now. Uh, before we hop into the show, though, I want to thank Backblaze for supporting this episode. Backblaze Online Backup. Five bucks a month. It's Mac native. Unlimited. Unthrottled. Uncomplicated. Setup takes about one minute, and you can try it for free at backblaze.com forward slash cultcast. Here's the thing about Backblaze. Leander, I know you use it. I've been using it for quite a while. It's just... Totally uncomplicated. You, you get it set up. The app works great on your Mac because it's built for a Mac. And there's no throttling. They don't measure your data. You can back up whatever you want, your computer hard drive, your external hard drives, as many hard drives as you have laying around the house. You can back it all up, and it's only $5 a month. Five bucks a month for unlimited backup. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> Stop me, Leander. Stop me. <laughs> it's off site. And, and like I say, it's dead easy. It's, um, it's really, I've been playing for it for a couple of years and it's been great. Yeah. It, 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 you know, like it's, it's a super, it's cheap for the peace of mind. Exactly. Exactly. And I always tell people, if you're not backing up, you're dingling. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that should be back. That should be back. Blaze this new, new motto. You're dingling if you don't back up. Because... <laughs> If something goes wrong, if your friend comes over to your house, Buster, and sits on your Mac with his big arse cheeks and breaks it in half. <laughs> you're screwed. You're screwed. You, you need to have your data backed up offsite. And I even have a time machine backup that I have uh, at my house. But I don't even do just that because guess what? Your house could burn down. If a crook breaks in and steals my time machine, there goes my backup. You got to have a plan to keep your data safe, all your pictures that you have, all your work items that you have. Head on over to backblaze.com. Try it out for free. They'll give you a two-week free trial. They don't even need your credit card number. And it's a totally unlimited trial. It's just like the real product that you would pay for. I want to thank Backblaze for supporting this episode. Hey, did we just lose someone? I don't know. Oh, we lost Alex. Okay. Okay. We're going to do it without Alex. Okay. Which, quite honestly, would be my personal preference. (laughs) (laughs) Thank God. Good words. Thank God. Uh, I called Comcast and asked if they could throttle his connection so we could do it without him. They happily obliged. Yeah, it worked. Um, So let's just jump right into it, guys, since Alex isn't going to be here. It's been three years since Steve Jobs passed away. It was October 5th, 2011. And... With all the Ben Gate stuff, stuff happening lately, I thought this was an interesting story. So uh, former Apple ad guy Ken Siegel, who we've had on the show before, uh, he wrote a blog, pl- a blog post about how Steve Jobs constructed Apple to deal with situations like Ben Gate, which, by the way, was it not totally – I mean, did it not blow up even more hugely than any of us expected? 
That video that uh, Lewis Helsentager posted is close to 49 million views right now. That's Can you guys nuts. believe it? I mean, yeah, it's like one of the biggest videos on YouTube. So I want to read you this little blurb from Ken Siegel about how, how Apple deals with stuff like this and how Steve Jobs prepped the company to deal with situations like this. He says, if you're familiar with this blog, you've probably heard me talk about the importance of Steve, the importance Steve Jobs placed on getting customers to love Apple. He wanted every part of the customer experience to strengthen that love from the advertising to the in-store experience to the unboxing to enjoying the product and getting support when needed. And by doing so, he ensured that customers would A, buy more stuff, B, evangelize to others. I'm guilty on both these. <laughs> And C, <laughs> stick with Apple when unforeseen problems arise. He understood that such things were inevitable, even for a company like Apple. And I thought about what Ken wrote here. And I think it's very true. I have a love for Apple as a company. And I would guess, correct me if I'm wrong, that you guys share that, at least to some degree, where we kind of have this implicit trust to them. And when there's a problem like this, I mean, I go right to their defense but I don't feel like it's a blind love, which is something we get accused of a lot from people who are fans of Android and Windows. Like, I feel like I love Apple because they create an excellent customer experience, excellent products. Even the packaging is great. Lander, what do you think? Yeah. Well, you know, people say that, you know, um, uh, we're members of a cult. And, uh, <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> You're talking <laughs> about Apple, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, we play it up as a, as a joke. You know, I mean, it's, it's the oldest cliche in the book about Apple. You, you know, Apple, Apple uses Apple fans. Uh, Sheeple. Mindless, yeah, mindless zombies who will buy and anything yeah. and, take, and take Steve's word. Which and, I think know. is horse crap. I don't think that's true at all. Uh, there's elements of it, I think. You know, there's definitely there's a little bit of, you know, f- uh, fire there to go with the smoke. I think that's, you know, but, but some people can, people can get really irrational about this stuff. And it is, has, has a certain kind of religious sort of well the feelings uh, people are very very strongly um, connected to their devices and their choice of platform and you can just definitely see this when you get into a conversation with android users mm-hmm. you know and and when um they debate the differences you know and but you know for, for a thing like bengate though i think you know like lewis i mean stoked that fire there was there was a thing on mac rumors and then he made this video and it was like oh my god look it it ma- he made it look like it was really easy to do this and, um, you know, it, it really did take – th- that was like Consumer Reports jumping in into the Antenna Gate scandal. <laughs> I mean, uh, Apple's stock price dropped 2% right. after that yeah, whole yeah. thing went live. I mean, this was, this was global news. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But, you know, as, but, but, you know the funny thing is, is it, it, it's a media phenomenon, right? It's a media storm. And they, Apple gets built up. It benefits. It benefited from this insane attention to the mm-hmm. iPhone six rumors and the launch, and then um, you know whenever the, it, it's inevitable. There's always a problem. There's been a problem with every single Apple product going back, you know, as far as I can remember, to you know the original Mac. The original Mac was called a toy. It was like a Fisher Price toy, and the tech press, you know, d- dismissed it as a as this ridiculous. Um, toy-like computer that wasn't suitable for real work, mm-hmm. and then you know the iPod. It was the the the, um, the fact that you couldn't replace the battery. The first iPhone was the fact that you couldn't replace the battery. The iMac was because it didn't have a floppy drive. Remember that people mm-hmm. said that the iMac was doomed. No one would buy the iMac because it didn't have a floppy drive in it. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> that, but that was the that was the Ben Gate for the iMac. That was and I remember that distinctly. That was a huge mainstream story. Because the iMac got so much attention, you know, in the build-up to it when it was launched, and they were like, oh, look at this crazy Jetsons computer. And then the press picked up, you know, a week later on the fact that it, you know, that it was, it was, it was basically a doomed, a beautiful but doomed product, just like Marilyn Monroe. And, Jeez, they say that. <laughs> so yeah, it was. God, that's thing. mean. <laughs> uh, and it's been for every major product since then. There's always been some huge problem, but this one definitely went, you know, massively globally viral. But I think that has a lot to do with the interest in the product itself. I mean, you know, the iPhone six is a massive global product, the biggest product that's been launched all year, maybe for you know since the last iPhone. I mean, what, I think that what, might be what, true. Yeah. What are the products? Even though, you know, uh, cars don't get this attention, nothing else gets this kind of attention. I can't think of anything. Even you, you know, like, this is why U2 is, like, trying to hitch their wagon to it. I mean, it used to be cultural products, right? Movies, games. Games, maybe. So, um, yeah. I would uh, argue that games still do that to a certain right. level, but not nearly as big as this product was. No. Movies don't. It used to be movies and it used to be albums, right? You know, like the Beatles album, whatever, or the latest um album from whatever, you know, Beyonce, right? So maybe Beyonce gets this kind of attention. <laughs> uh-huh. 
But I, you know, it's right. It's I think it's bigger than that for sure. Oh, I do whole, too. It totally feels global, bigger. People lining up. People didn't line up for Beyonce's album. I would say the the last thing that I remember being this big was that Robin Thicke cut. Um, <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember. I can't blurred remember lines. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but, but that's a great example. That's a great analogy because that was also accompanied by huge controversy, wasn't it? Yeah, because yeah. they had that model in it. Oh, they had they did that music video where all the girls were topless, right? And I actually didn't even realize for many many weeks, and that that was why that song had gotten uh, so popular. Of course, it's it's a sweet cut. <laughs> I mean, there's that there's that too. All right. Let me take us back to the whole idea of blinded apple love because this this is what really always annoys me when people talk about how apple fans are sheep which i think i I think is bull i think that we're very discerning of things of high quality and value and we're willing to pay a higher price for things that um you know deliver in those two areas and i don't think that we just buy whatever apple releases i consider myself a very discerning it consumer if something sucks i won't purchase it i don't care if apple releases it i don't care if microsoft releases it um you know may i have a little bit of blindness towards apple yeah i think that i probably do i might trust them a little bit more i might more willingly go into an impulse purchase on an apple product but i feel like the reason i love their products so much is because they're 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 always such a, of consistent high quality that i'm like okay i know that i'm gonna get something that i really like and I'm not just buying it because Apple put, puts craps it out, and I'm like, okay, here's another thousand bucks. Thanks, Apple. Yeah, I don't believe a word of that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all bullshit. You're just, you're just rationalizing your, you know, your your, your brand loyalty. No, no, no. Because even even the even the Apple Watch. I and Buster, you and I have had this conversation. I think even on the show, like I'm going to buy one, but I am ap- apprehensive about it because I still don't know what the purpose of this product is and why I should want to wear one. But I am still going to buy one. Sally, and you've just done exactly what you said you wanted. Okay, no, no, you no, no. You didn't think me... any mouth that said you were going to buy one. And then he said, I don't think I really need it. I don't really know what I'm going to use it for, but I'm going to figure that out afterwards. <laughs> okay, but hold on. I'm doing this because we're on a podcast. We need, to, we need to have experience with the watch. If I wasn't on this show, I would probably not purchase it. And I would listen to somebody else's podcast who had bought one and was reviewing it. <laughs> right. Okay. So there you go. You're right. I would let someone Another else waste the money. <laughs> I've done this loads of times. Like I remember that I bought a MacBook, you know, years ago and, 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 and I did it on the quiet. I put on this like credit card that we barely use. And I was thinking, oh my God, what am I going to tell Tracy? <laughs> <laughs> hit me with a frying pan. I like that you're telling this story on the podcast, by the way. Yeah. Right. So then I was like, oh, I know, you know, like I'm supposed to be writing a book. So I, I'll tell her I, I had to buy it so I could work <laughs> on the book at a cafe, right? Because we didn't have any portables. We didn't have a notebook at the time. So uh-huh. it turned out this whole rationalization. And then I sort of like came to believe it myself. And then that became the reason I bought it when really I just did it because I was lusting after it. I was drooling over it. I just wanted it <laughs> immediately. It was a total, you know, like super expensive impulse buy. I just had to have it. <laughs> which which uh, MacBook was it? I, you know, I, it was probably one of the early Like the MacBook G4s or models. something? No, they were, they were too pricey. It was like, I think one of the first, like, um, uh, you know, um, al- aluminum MacBooks, MacBooks. I don't even remember. Oh, yeah, that. those things were, yeah, it was like a power book. It was so hot. Yeah, those just, things you know, were sexy I, as hell. Yeah, I just had the hearts for it so bad. Yeah. It was oh. like cheating on Tracy. It was like I really <laughs> – I had impure thoughts about it. I was really, really, really – uh, and I had to keep it secret. It was like a – you know, like – You were having uh, an affair. Yeah, right, yeah. And then I had to dream up all these reasons afterwards to try to, to, you know, to explain it, to rationalize it. But I definitely like that. You know, like the minute I see the new iPhone, I just – you know, I, I – I, I gotta have it, and then I rationalize afterwards all the reasons why I need it. I need the bigger screen, I got the faster LTE. But those are those. I know this. They're rationalizations. They're bullshit. It's, it's like <laughs> uh, it's like why we always end up buying the bigger phone, like the, like the six plus we talked about in previous shows. How we were all we were, we were like we we don't have a choice. We know we're gonna get the six plus, even though it's more expensive, even though it's it's bigger, and we don't think we necessarily need the big screen. We have to have it because Apple says it's the best that they make. <laughs> So that's, I think the, it's like, that's when we have to buy it, it. Yeah, I had, you know, like I used to, uh, people, should, uh, some friends had a Samsung. You know, I remember um, uh, one guy showed me a Samsung and I was like, uh, first time I'd seen a big screen phone like that. Now, oh my God, I really had, um, you know, screen envy real bad. Uh-huh. But, you know, then you turn it over and it's kind of clunky and it's ugly as all hack. And it has know? like that fake, that fake stitching in the plastic itself to make it look like leather. Yeah, you know, it was just, it was, uh, and, 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 and immediately, you know, my... 
interest in it just just was you know like it was I didn't like it at all. It was it put me off. It was you know it was it was repulsive. <laughs> exactly, it has like the appearance of of high quality, and then you go to use it. My friend was just showing me his uh, Galaxy Notes and it has a huge screen. Same exact impression that you have. I started playing around with it. I looked at the UI, and the UI was hideous. Absolutely hideous. There were icons puked all over yeah. this thing. It had no, it had no discernible style. It was just a bunch of hodgepodge of icons dumped onto one screen. It was just a totally different experience. Right, but and but what's important is your emotional reaction, right? And you go from "ooh, that's interesting" to this kind of "ugh," you know. Yeah, I was disgusted. I I was like, "Get this away from me!" (laughs) Pushed it at him. (laughs) I know you sound like the worst kind of apple snob, but you are. We both are. We are. We're we're exactly what. You know why? You know. You know why we we don't go for Android devices because we have impeccable taste. We have impeccable (laughs) taste, and I think that people that really love Apple stuff share that value. Yeah. Right. We have You're very high Apple. quality standards, and yeah, and you see this. You see this. Definitely. If you go down the Apple Store, everyone is fondling the products. It's kind of gross because you can imagine all those goodies well, on. Well, especially but, when you use that word, jeez. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> even with the MacBooks and stuff like that, you know, like people don't just sit there and type on it. They're picking it up and they're caressing the thing. Yeah, it's very, very um, tactile and um, physical. You know, there's definitely this kind of physical. Um, you know, it has to have that physical attractiveness. And I think that's what Apple has brought to its products forever is that, is that physical attractiveness that, that, that kicks in that emotive, you know, lust factor, the drool, you know, the, 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 the gotta have it, this insane kind of crazy, like being in love. You can't eat, you can't sleep. All you can think about is that new MacBook, you know. You know what's funny is I, I, can, I can actually say with all honesty, I have had that feeling about several Apple products. It's like when you're touching it and you, you're, fill, you're filled with like this sense of desire. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of weird, but right. it's very true. And I remember my first uh, power book that I ever had. That's exactly how I felt. In fact, I felt so strongly that way that I ended up writing a blog post about it to express myself. I probably wrote like some poetry about it or something. <laughs> yeah. it's, probably, it's probably around here somewhere. Yeah. Dig but you're up. very right. That's exactly what, what uh, a response I have to these devices. Right. It's like falling in love. It's very, very emotional. Emotional. Yeah. And that's what a lot of tech companies – I mean the only other people who do this are like fashion companies and car companies. People have these feelings about cars but not about any other technology, I don't think. I can't think of anything anyway. I kind of get the same sense of uh, – of that same sense of amour when, I, when I'm around BMWs, like really nice BMWs. Like I feel like they have that same kind of fashion sense to them. Right. So do I. But you know what? You know what though? I can't stand BMW drivers. <laughs> you know, you're not the first person that has said that to me. Why is that? Because I'm thinking about becoming one. <laughs> I love you too. I love cars. I, think gorgeous. I, I just can't bear to become one of those people. <laughs> you mean extremely elitist and yeah. uh, kind of snobby? Yeah. <laughs> right. I'm, sure, I'm sure that wouldn't happen to us. Who say things like they have impeccable taste on pun and pun big podcast. <laughs> hey, I was joking. <laughs> wink, wink. I was totally kidding. Oh, right. wink, wink, wink. Um, well, hey, before we move on, I just want to say, in honor of Steve Jobs passing away, we did this last year. Uh, we're going to do it again this year. I have um, gotten permission to broadcast his 2005 commencement address from um, Stanford University. It's I think probably one of his best talks that I've heard, and I've listened to a lot of Steve Jobs talks, it's right after he had found out that he had cancer, and at the time he thought that he had been cured of cancer, and just a really remarkable talk where he talks about what's important to life, uh, you know, his, his sense about Apple, and things that he's learned from his life and from building a company. So we're going to be broadcasting that talk in its entirety at the very end of the show. If you're interested in hearing it, do stick around, please. I listen to it several times a year. It's a very inspirational piece of audio for me. So I, I really love sharing it with people. Um, let's, we, we already talked about Ben Gate a little bit. Well, uh, uh, did Buster, have, did Buster, didn't you have some interesting things to say about um, <laughs> how Apple PR handled Ben Gates? How they handled it? Yeah, you know, by by you know the the um you know first of all saying it was like you know very limited and then inviting the press in to see the testing procedures. Yeah, I didn't have anything interesting to say about it. I don't think, <laughs> okay. but I mean, what I about thought, anything? I thought it was interesting how they. <laughs> how about handled just it, anything? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they were very quiet on it for you know like three days, and then they did only let you know like 
maybe five outlets come in to like see the testing process and everything. Um, but so exactly what they did with um, the antenna gate, though, right? It was like first yeah. of all minimize it, and then show um, the press, you know, that they that they had already anticipated this stuff, or they they try to test for it. Yeah, exactly. But I, uh, when you look at their test, they don't really do necessarily the same kind of test that Lewis did with like the <laughs> right. three point test right at the volume button either. So, I mean, I think there is probably something to be said said about like the case's weakness, and I don't think they really addressed like. Oh, here's the structural flaw that everybody seemed to find. You know, right? That was an interesting post that you did, right? About where they, um, there was a weakness of the at the volume buttons, or right, yeah, weakness. Yeah, like the structural reinforcement there. Like it doesn't, you know, come past like the volume button. So it's just really re- weak at that one spot, which is exactly how Lewis was bending it in his video. But Apple's machines, they kind of bend it more like straight on in the middle. So I think to what you're saying, Buster, I mean, Lewis's point was if you bend it in this specific po- spot, which is, you know, where, where the volume buttons are, it has a weakness and, yeah. and it will bend. Now, whether or not it will bend in your pocket, I think is the real question, because obviously right. smashing it with your thumbs, you're going to be able to bend just about anything in your house. Yeah. I'm, yeah. If you, if you apply enough force, like, you know, his hands are red and you see like those kids go into the Apple store and breaking them and like they're like shaking trying to break. Oh it, my you know? gosh. By the way, Buster's <laughs> speaking about the two biggest idiots on earth. <laughs> they are they are the biggest idiots on earth, I think. They went into an Apple store, but before they did... Now, me and my friend Danny... What's going on, man? Yo, what's up, man? Yeah, basically, we went into the Apple store, and we actually bent the iPhone 6 Plus. They broadcasted themselves with their faces, and they give their names. And they're like, we don't believe that these things are going to bend, so we're going to go in and prove it. And they go into an Apple store and start bending the iPhones in the store. And then they yeah. posted the video on YouTube. Just so defiantly. And then they're just like, oh, well, it's Apple's <laughs> fault that these bed. Yes. And then they said it was Apple's fault. <laughs> I mean, they're teenagers. They're going to learn. You just can't, you can't film yourself on YouTube. I'm and, sure there was uh, tons of people doing that over the weekend, you know, just right. going yeah, and just were. tested it a little bit. Yeah, yeah there probably were, but they weren't, they weren't uh, so ingenious as to broadcast their faces <laughs> yeah, exactly. and their first and last names and then post it on YouTube. I mean, they did like $2,500 worth of damage, those two idiots did. <laughs> I don't I didn't actually watch the video, but they didn't get nicked. They didn't get security. They didn't clamp a big meaty pole on their shoulders. <laughs> I don't think so. Apple, the Apple store policy is pretty non-evasive. Like you're not supposed to, you know, kick people out from what I understand, talking to former geniuses, unless, you know, like there's a serious destroying, (laughs) destroying the equipment, unless there's fire involved. They just let it, they just let it go. (laughs) Oh, mad. Yeah, because we, we were down at the Apple store at the weekend, and, and the guy said, yeah, oh, yeah, everyone's coming in, and they're trying to bend it. But they, they're not doing it seriously. They're just sort of, you know, gently yeah. flexing it if they can. Yeah. I cannot show my iPhone to somebody without them asking if it's bent. Every single yeah. person I've showed it to has asked me that question. It's unbelievable. People that didn't even know that Apple had released a new iPhone are asking me that question. My mom asked me that question. <laughs> you know, my mom may not even know, have, have, have ever heard what an iPhone was. <laughs> and yet she's asking me if it's if it's if I've had any problems with it bending. I mean, this video. I, so I've been talking to Lou kind of um, on and off ever since this whole thing happened. And, and, and my impression is, I mean, he's just as surprised as anyone else. This video has gotten like 50 million views, and he was on every major national you know press program. And it's it sucks to see that people are kind of churning on him now and kind of calling him a fraud for doing this. My personal belief is I think he was just following his nose. Right. He saw there might have been a problem. He decided to test it, and he you know he's got good instincts, and yeah, he made right. a video, and and you know the video exploded. I don't think he was doing anything to to make money. There's no way you could architect a oh, video yeah. this I big like that. Yeah, there's just no way. So I think that he he's on to something. I think there probably is a legitimate problem in, in a very small case of situations. And uh, we're going to be talking about the iPhone 6 in just a sec because now that I have one and um, I'm using it in my pockets and stuff, I can definitely see if you have skinny jeans or you have pockets that are not like mom jean size. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> forgive, apologies, uh, forgiveness to all the mom jean wearers. Yeah, out there. hey, what do you? What, yeah, what, hey, what, sorry, what, Leander. I know that you things? love mom jeans because you love comfort, and that's fine. But if you're not wearing those jeans, then the the phone definitely sits in your pocket in kind of a weird way. In fact, I've kind of noticed that I often just don't even want to keep it in my pocket because it's just 
too huge. Actually, before we hop into that, so I want to talk about my impressions with iPhone 6 Plus, and I want to hear what you guys think now that you've been using it for a couple weeks. Before we do that, I want to thank Very Desk for supporting this episode. That's V-A-R-I desk.com. Uh, Buster, you and I talked about Very Desk before. They make these really nifty stand-up desks that you can use on top of your existing desk, and they're completely adjustable, and you can lift them from a sitting position to a standing position in just about three seconds. I am a standing desk convert. I'm going to say this totally, genuinely, authentically. I think that moving to a standing desk is probably one of the best decisions I've ever made in my entire life. Um, you know, when you sit all day long, you just get lethargic. It, your metabolism yeah. slows way down. You turn into a big old chunk, and you just don't feel good. And, you know, in, in today's modern age, when you're sitting down a lot, it's, it's really good to stand up, stretch, you know, and get some exercise. But the great thing about standing desks is they increase your metabolism, and they help you burn calories even when you're not doing anything really active. Just by the act of standing, you are burning far more calories than you would be sitting down. And... You do get tired, which is one of the reasons why you want it to be adjustable and why it's great that Very Desk adjusts so fast because eventually your legs are going to get tired, your calves are going to get tired, and you're going to want to sit down. You don't want to be standing all day. That's going to be kind of excessive. But when you do that, you're definitely going to notice an improvement. I mean, I have way more energy now. I've lost some weight. I mean, I was already in pretty much perfect shape before. Buster, <laughs> you know that. Yeah. But my, my six-pack abs have transformed into eight-pack abs now. Dang. And my biceps are just even more delineated in my arms. And, and I, just look, I look great. Right. I wish I, okay. I should post a picture of myself online so you guys can see. But... I count that hugely to, to switching to a standing desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, that's actually really cool. We saw one at CES, and they were, I was really impressed. They, you know, the key is to keep you moving, right? So it keeps on uh, – it, it makes it you know, stand up if you've been sitting down for a while. Exactly. You exactly. Can set it so it'll, it'll, it'll make it stand up. And it's not, you know, it's not all standing all the time because that's actually kind of hard. When I started standing yeah. up, I found it like you – know, I felt like a, you know, some poor shop girl. Um, you know, with, with, with really bad varicose veins, and and it was just killing me. It took me a couple of weeks to get to get used to it. Um, it wasn't actually that pleasant to begin with. So the very desk, you know, eases you into that because it allows you to sort of sit for a while, but then it makes you stand up. The thing exactly. you don't want to be doing is sitting all the time, is it? That's or standing me. all the time. Yeah, you don't want to do either, really, because yeah. either one is not healthy. You kind of want to mix it up. And I've gotten to a point now where when I sit too long, I notice. You know, I start to get antsy. And then when I stand too long, my, my calves start hurting. So um, in any case, Very Desk is great because most any desks are like $1,500 plus. Very Desks start at 275 You don't need a ton of space like a normal desk because you can just use it on your existing desk. Go check it out at verydesk.com, V-A-R-I desk.com. They have four models that you can choose from. And uh, if you decide to make a purchase, I know some of you out there have because you've been tweeting me about, about them, um, please use the code uh, cultcast in the how did you hear about us section so they know that we sent you guys. Um, that helps us and um, we'll make them hopefully you know, continue sponsoring the show. So we want to thank Verydesk for their support. Buster. Breathing into that mic. Oh, shoot. Let me get away from it. My bad. <laughs> you were doing that earlier, too. I was like, ooh, someone's tired. Too much standing. <laughs> time, to, time to take a seat, Buster. <laughs> too much very desk. Um, so, guys, let me ask you this. I've got my giant surfboard here, a.k.a. my 6 Plus. And I'll be honest. I'm a week in with it, and people have been asking me what I think. And I kind of compare it to dancing with a supermodel. It's a great experience. It's very beautiful, but she's <laughs> taller than me, and the whole thing's a little awkward, and I'm not really sure where to put my hands. I'm a little embarrassed that she's so much taller than me. That's kind of my experience with the 6 Plus so far. It's, it's a great phone. I love it, but it's so huge. I can barely fit it in my pocket, and because the, the edges are so round, <laughs> I find that I, that I have a hard time picking it up off flat surfaces because the phone what? is kind of heavy. And there's nothing to really to grab onto. It's just like so – it's so round. Um, <laughs> sounds like uh, <laughs> cervix a lot. I can't believe it's so round. It's like out there. I mean, gross. I think got back. <laughs> <laughs> so round. It's out there. And, and big. Oh. Now be serious, Buster. I mean, oh. just, just look at it. Too, too much smaller. smaller. <laughs> 
I like big. Okay. Um, are you guys feeling this way? Are you guys sharing my sentiment here? Oh, I I felt a little bit of that like the first two days because it's a little awkward. And here's the thing: is I feel like the iPhone six plus is a two handed device. So it is a two handed device. Yes, differently than your iPhone five S. And like after two weeks, I have has it been two weeks yet? Almost. I I've, I don't think I would go back to like the five S size ever again. It's just like right. way too tiny. Like what about like the now. what about the six? Would you consider going back to the six? Or are you are you I, sold? Like you love the six. I'd plus. consider it, but I think Apple needs to do is not necessarily uh, change the size of the screen. I think they need to get rid of the uh, the bezel, slim it down a little bit. Because I went to Best Buy over the weekend and held like. Uh, the LG 5.5 inch screen and one of the uh, Samsungs and they're like just a little bit smaller, not as thin, but you know, uh, not as tall as the iPhone six. I think that would help a little bit. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. And and the screen is, I mean, there's a good inch on top of the screen, you know, on both sides. Yeah. They could definitely shrink that down. It's going to be edge to edge. The screen is going to be edge to edge. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is what they need to do. Well, what do you, what do you think? I mean, do you ever feel like, is it is it too big for you? I mean, um, I kind of find like I, I can never feel like it's secure in my hand. I'm always worried I'm going to drop it. Like Buster said, there's no way you can use this thing one handed. I mean, I find FaceTime oh, calls to be a little yeah. awkward. What, what do you think? No, no, you can totally use it one hand um, because I got like unnaturally long chicken fingers. <laughs> <laughs> you must have mutant hands because I have big hands too. It's it, you got to get used to it. Like you know the way you normally you know you, you've got to it. If you use it one hand, it tends to get a bit unbalanced, right? Because mm-hmm. it sticks at the top. So you've got to kind of move your hand. You've got to move it down your hand so that it's, it's, it's balanced in it. Um, um, but you can totally use it one hand. I use it one hand all the time. I mean, you can't, you know, it's not like uh, you, you, sometimes you have to hold it to go to the far left corner with your mm-hmm. other hand. But you can do a lot of things one handed, especially if you're using, you know, the plus reachability feature. Yeah, the, and the reachability just to reach those furthest icons. But you know, a lot of the, a lot of the action goes on at the bottom of the screen anyway. So I found I can use it one handed. I did have to adjust the grip a little bit mm-hmm. and get used to that. Get used to the size. So I think it's a, you know, it's kind of like a muscle memory thing. It's just you know, it's like playing tennis with a bigger racket or whatever, and it <laughs> like a giant clown racket. Hey, <laughs> <Right. laughs> <laughs> you know, I've gotten used to it, like like Buster says, and, I, and now the older phones seem ridiculously small. I know my they, five seems like a child's toy. <laughs> right, I know it's funny, and that plus, you know, the pocket thing. I mean, I, I, you know, I guess I don't wear the tightest jeans any longer, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I've, I've been keeping it in my back pocket, and every single day I sit on it in the car or on the couch. <laughs> wow. And I go, oh no, my fat two hundred pound ass is just <laughs> <laughs> of pure muscle. Yeah, it but has that, probably damaged my phone, is what you think. I, you know, and I get that horrible sinking feeling, and I quickly panically reach for it, uh, and because it's totally fine. And I, you know, I feel like an idiot because I do this every single day, and it's like, oh my god, when am I ever going to like, you know, uh, learn not to do this? But I'm so <laughs> used to keeping it in my back pocket. But but you know, I don't think I think the whole bent thing is overblown because. I sat on it pretty hard, like a couple of times in the car, mm-hmm. um, and the car's kind of low down, you know. So you know, when you get in, you kind of fall in, yeah, <laughs> and then <laughs> whack down on the thing, and, and uh, it hasn't. Of course, I'm sitting on a seat, right? I'm not sitting on a wall or anything hard. Um, the seat, you know, has some. Do you it, think it, it has it, anything it, to do with like how maybe spongy and malle- malleable your rear end cheeks might be, <laughs> so they just totally conform? Exactly. Yeah, right. it's like pressing it between two giant soft yeah, pillows. Exactly. <laughs> it's like trying to press on it from both sides with a pillow and trying to bend it. <laughs> that might have something to do with it. Yeah. Buster, you, you, do you keep the phone in your pocket? Because here's the other thing that I have kind of um, been thinking about. So the phone is so big and so heavy that I find that when it's in my pocket, I notice, and it's heavier than my last phone is. So I, I feel like it's pulling my pants down. <laughs> So and then and then my pants are going to come down in front of all the kids and they're all going to laugh at me, Dude, which wear worries a bell. me. Don't, don't invest I, you know, in a belt. You know, honestly, I have I've had I have had start. <laughs> I can't speak. I can't speak. I have started wearing a belt more often because of that exact problem. And you can get one of those belt holsters for the iPhone Six Plus. Now that's it that's the, really cool at the mall and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know that was an option. I think I might need to look into yeah, that. Yeah, maybe you should get some Mulk and Mindy suspenders too. <laughs> <laughs> if you get a wardrobe malfunction, so the, the problem here is my wardrobe. Down like they've been yanked down. 
<laughs> but Buster, I find that I don't want to carry it in my pocket because it's so big. And you know, when you don't carry it in your pocket, you don't get the advantage of the motion coprocessor tracking your steps because it's not with you. So uh-huh. like the health app can't really track your steps as well because you're not carrying the phone. Are, are you carrying this phone in your pocket as much as you were your last phone? Uh, like when I'm in my house, I usually kind of set it on the desk. And Me just too. There, and that's, Me too. But that's cool. And I think once the Apple Watch comes out, I think it kind of solves a lot of – it will solve a lot of like the portability problems with like the 6 Plus where like the 6 Plus will just be like your main portable computer that you leave everywhere and then your iPhone – watch or apple watch will be how you interact with it you know i think it actually like, might be an apple conspiracy theory like they released a phone that was so big that they knew you're gonna have to buy an accessory <laughs> device to actually use your phone because you're never gonna have it with you so they released the a- apple watch so that you could actually do all the things on your wrist that you were not doing on your phone anymore because it was never actually in your pocket yeah i i don't have a problem carrying it in the pocket though you know so uh and when it's in your pocket do you ever when you sit down and stuff do you ever notice that's there because i'll be honest i can barely put my socks on (laughs) because when i lift my leg up this freaking thing presses into my junk area and it doesn't (laughs) feel very nice So I have to like bend over like a grandpa and put my socks on. Maybe you should put your phone on last. <laughs> right, on there you go. <laughs> hey, don't tell me how to dress. Although is that the way Apple recommends? Because I think so. It's I think the, that's in the, the iPhone guy. 6 yeah. Plus yeah, user guy. manual. <laughs> Please put socks on first before putting phone in pocket. I, I never really notice it. I mean, well, I do notice it, but I just don't let it bother me, I guess. Well, I got to say, I, I, out of all that, um, the phone is sexy. So sexy. Oh, the Sizzling display is hot. just amazing, The right? display is the best display I have ever seen on any device ever. I know that sounds like hyperbole, but it's not. I really, I really feel that way. It's an unbelievable phone. And, and I love how, ra- how the edges of the phone are rounded off. So like when you're swiping and stuff on like mailbox and stuff, just it just kind of like, yeah, it's like, it's like you just – your finger just floats off the phone, floats off the phone. There's not a single edge on this thing. And the buttons are so wonderfully clicky. Can you hear it? I'm doing it right now. <laughs> you can oh. hear it, yeah. <laughs> you can't hear it? Yeah, there you go. So I guess it's just me. You guys love your phones and Well, I think no uh, for a lot of people, I think the 6 actually is the best phone for most people. Because I do think the 6 Plus is just kind of like enormously huge. So I think unless you're willing to like make some compromises, I think most people should go with the 6. I agree. And we've talked about this on previous shows. I, it's not a phone for everyone. I really don't believe that. I mean, the 6 is a great phone. I think it's probably suited for most people. The 6 Plus, Buster, you said this before, and I totally agree now that I've been using this for a week, is this phone isn't a tablet, and it's not a phone either. It's a whole new device. And I'm kind of learning how to interact with it right now. Um, and, and you know, so far, the, I really like the experience, but it's it's been a little bumpy. What? Well, you know, one of the things I think they might do is uh, look at making uh, changing iOS for bigger screens. I think so too. Yeah, I think yeah. You mean I mean, creating some, a whole new user experience for a larger yeah, screen? Yeah, I think that's right. a great idea. Yeah, and I think. Sorry. Well, no, go on, Buster. You. I just think they need some different tools for the six plus. Like you have all this like extra pixels, like 2 million more pixels or something, but it just all the same tools are there. And so I don't think it really takes advantage of like the big display as much as it could. I don't right. either. I don't either. You know, you know what's going to be interesting is all the jailbreakers. I, I'd love to see yeah. some jailbreakers do like, especially if they're taking cues from the Apple watch. Like I thought the Apple watch UI looked gorgeous. <laughs> And like you know, the, the old grid of um, icons. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't it be cool if you if if you had a if you had like a much more responsive um, icon grid that was that you could move around, you know, with your thumb at the bottom and pull icons just, down towards you like the Apple Watch. Yeah, possibly even one that uh, intelligently adapts to like the, your most used apps and kind of right. rearranges stuff for you. I, like it looks like the Apple Watch kind of does that a little bit. I don't know. I think that would be useful. I'm kind of tired of the uh, the the squares on the screen interface now. Yeah, right. I would love to. I would love to see them become dynamic in some way. Yeah, you know, I hate to say this, but like the Windows Phone does it. Like I obviously tiles. don't want it to look like the Windows Phone, but that functionality is a good idea. Yeah, yeah live tiles, so they're a little bit more Just dynamic. It's, yeah, exa- it's expansive. You you know, you have like four different options for each app. You know, I think that would be great. And give developers the option to build functionality into their icons, so they can you know have them do something. Instead mm-hmm. of just be, you know, a pretty static, looking, static picture, yeah, of the icon itself. 
Um, so there you go. Uh, for those of you who've been asking about my iPhone 6 Plus, but, oh, wait, before we move on, the camera on this phone is oh, gorgeous. unbelievable. So we've had With Hearts on, uh, famous Instagrammer. I've been noticing his pictures um, have just taken they've – been, they've been taken to a whole new level. And the dynamic range on them has increased, which is the ability to show um, you know, different shades of light in one picture without something being too dark and something else being too bright. And his pictures have just gotten creamier. So I, I pinged him, and I'm like, hey, you, you know, you're using the 6 Plus. How do you like, like it? And he was just like, yeah, it's, it's an unbelievable camera. And uh, I've been playing around with it, and I've noticed the dynamic range on this camera is just unbelievable. It's it's the best I've ever seen on a on a phone. Have you been using the manual controls? Didn't... Oh. I played around a little bit with them, but I haven't played around with them a ton. Buster, what were you going to say? Have you used uh, the app Manual? No. It's uh, it gives you like full control of like you know shutter speed, ISO, aperture, everything. It's like super awesome app, and it works really great with like the six plus because you have extra room for like the extra buttons on the screen Mm -hmm. you know if somebody's looking like put like the six plus to like the full like max potential i think you should try that app manual looking Mm -hmm. at it right now uh two bucks yeah i think it's worth it i'm gonna try it out i want to have control over the aperture It, it basically puts like dslr controls on your iphone don't some of the other camera apps do that as well though yeah, know, they're so probably they all building do. it in because it's it's new in iOS 8, right? That they can control that stuff. Yeah, this is the first one that I think has really nailed it really well, though. Like the, all of the tools are just right there at your fingertips and everything. Manual. It sounds uh, exactly how, or it's spelled exactly how it sounds. Check it out. <laughs> um, before we wrap up, guys, let's talk about Mark Newson. So you guys kind of made fun of me a little bit and said this is old news which is true it's a, it's a couple weeks old but with all the uh, apple uh, announcements happening we weren't able to really talk about how apple has hired a new industrial designer and i think this is kind of def- i think it's definitely newsworthy and feel free to pipe in here at any time so mark newson is a famous industrial designer he has been a friend of Johnny I for quite a long time. They've collaborated on um, some Apple projects together. They've also more recently collaborated on some Project Red product designs for Leica cameras. And they made a table together or a, a desk together that they sold at auction for Bono's Red Charity. And they raised like, you know, millions of dollars. And he's recently been hired by Apple. And I thought this was really cool because. Speaking of Steve Jobs, since we were talking about him this episode, so he was kind of Johnny Ives' collaborator. And, you know, Leander, you feel free to, to add any additional information here since you wrote both the books <laughs> <laughs> about Steve Jobs and Johnny Ives. But, you know, Steve Jobs was famously very involved in product creation. And I know that Tim Cook said in that New York Times um, article that they wrote about him that he really wasn't so much involved in the day-to-day creation of new products. That's not really his forte. And it seemed to me like Johnny has been operating for the last three years without that counterpart in design. And if that were me, I think that that would be really tough. You know, you're used to collaborating with someone and he, you know, passes away and you don't have that partner anymore. And now he has Mark Newson with him. I think this could be really big for Apple. <laughs> right. I think, it's a, I think it's a super interesting theory. And I think, um, you know, the trouble is that they haven't really given any insight into how how they're working together. Mm-hmm. And in fact, Apple today, I mean, they were, they were, they were, the, the European press was trying to ask Mark Newsom what he was, you know, what Apple hired him to do and what he's been working on. And the PR department was keeping really tight um, uh, uh, rein on him and a uh, tight leash and, and, mm-hmm. and refusing and not letting him answer, answer any questions. Like, are you working on the Apple Watch? Well, I'm afraid I can't say that. Well, what are you working on? Well, I can't really say that either, you know. So, um, uh, uh, you know, he... It's difficult to know exactly what capacity he's been working. I was pretty sure that he's been working on the watch. I mean, Killian did a great gallery of all the de- of how the Apple Watch was very much like Newsom's watch designs over the years, mm-hmm. and all the straps uh, you know Newsom designed for what was it called Icapod, which is his Swiss yeah. watch company. So he'd already solved a whole bunch of design problems. Oh, um, so you think that he was already very involved on the Apple Watch project? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's been working on it for more than a year. So you think and, this just kind of cemented it? It's like, okay, he's already been working here. Let's just make it official. Yeah, right. a lot of the, the Apple Watch details look like some of his iCapod uh, designs too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah, 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 exactly. And I think you know he has experience in a whole bunch of different products. He has a ton of fashion experience. Um, he's a really good public you know, figurehead. He's a good person to help sort of share those 
kind of you know design PR duties with with Johnny, mm-hmm. who 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 I know isn't for, you know who's is uncomfortable with that kind of stuff, like you know going out in the public and telling the story. Mm-hmm. I mean, I talked to a couple of the designers of the Apple Watch event, and and you know I was trying to get them to to you know to to tell me about the Mark Newsom hire, and what they said was you know that they were they were super busy. They've got more projects than ever. Mm-hmm. This watch thing is a massive, massive project, and. They needed the extra help. I mean, they just mm-hmm. need. And I was like, R- "Really? What? It's that simple? You know, you just, you know, they, they, they just needed extra bodies, you know, to, to come yeah. in there. And somebody, um, Mark is somebody that Johnny knows and trusts. They have exactly the same aesthetics, the same design sense. And you can they, tell they get along very well too. Like anytime you see right. them talking together, you can tell they're very close with one another. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You know, they, and they say that in all these interviews. In fact, it's kind of weird. <laughs> uh, you know, the, uh, <laughs> but he like had his hand on like Mark's thigh really high, and I was like, that seems odd. <laughs> and, uh, <they> <laughs> and like uh, you know, Mark was playing with Johnny's head the whole time, like stroking his head. <laughs> right. I was like, oh, weird. Well, Bono was in some. Uh, 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 who was it? Vanity Fair, I think, did an interview today, uh, a profile, and uh, Bono was quoted as saying, "They they not only finish each other's sentences, they finish each other's food, and then they giggle." And they- <laughs> <laughs> And they're like, stop it. Yeah, I know. It's, um, yeah, it is a little bit, it is a bit strange, you know, like like two twins. But apparently they are like that. They're like two, you know, sort of design savants that are like yeah. co-joined twins. You know, they, they have exactly the same sensibility. So, you know, I like that theory about, you know, like with Jobs and, and being Ives, um, you know, collaborative. I mean, Johnny actually I think is more important is the team that, w- that he works with, the, the industrial designers are like 18 or 20 22 now mm-hmm. you know i think his team was 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 as important if not more important than his collaboration with jobs i think what jobs did was enable the design team in within apple that he made them the most powerful group in, in the room you know he made them uh lead the product development and push stuff through that they wanted to get done you know that the engineers and the and the people who, who worked in the factories and stuff like that said no no we can't do that it's too crazy you know it was jobs that kicked down the doors and you know, put his boot on their neck and made them do that. <laughs> Quite and, literally. <laughs> yeah, and changed Apple's culture. I mean, of course, he had a, he had a lot of um, input into into particular design decisions, and he would make a lot. He'd make a lot of design decisions with Johnny. But you know, the, the impression I got was that Johnny didn't show him anything that he didn't want him to choose. You know, so he was always a little bit leading. Mm-hmm. You know, Jobs. But that's how Jobs worked. I mean, Jobs was involved in not just the industrial design, but also the software design, the marketing. You know that he 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 poured over every single detail of that company, mm-hmm. and so his he had back to back meetings, and all the meetings were super tightly scheduled. They have an agenda of all these different things they had to show jobs, and he liked to see things in threes. You know, he liked to see three alternatives. So if they were working on like new buttons, he wanted to see three versions of the, of, a, of the button they were going to you know make it uh, choose, mm-hmm. and he would choose one of them. Mm-hmm. You know, so in a certain sense, I mean, they never put the, the, you know the, the designers had already kind of made decisions about what to show Steve, you know, and, and he would make the final decision and they'd often have an argument about it. So, you know what I mean? It's like he had a super important, his role was, you know, it's, it's kind of strange. It's like, you know, he had a, he, he had a very important role, but, 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 you know, without a replacement there, you know, how the functions without him is, is still an open question, I think, you know. Yeah. Of course, people are saying with the Apple Watch that, you know, that, that there, there are very much signs that, that, that innovation is still alive and well at at, at, uh, at Apple without Steve, and mm-hmm. I tend to agree with that. We'll have to see when it comes out. I mean, it, it looks like an amazing product, and I think they muddled the messaging a little bit because the introduction was like it does this and it does this and it does this and 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 this <laughs> and, and this like, and this. <laughs> yeah, you know. So we'll see. You know, like it's obviously a, it's a platform like the iPhone, and and its potential is vast. You know, yeah, the, the you're iPhone, right. But, Sorry, go ahead. Well, just that, you know, and I think that, you know, Steve was very disciplined in when he introduced the iPhone, he said, like, it's a great phone, it's a great iPod, and it's a great internet, you know, communicator. It's a, what did he say, a breakthrough internet communication device? And, Something like that, yeah. But then it was like, you know, he showed browsing and he showed um, messaging, but not that much more, you know, and of course the App Store hadn't come out yet, but I mean, uh, you know, I, if, he, he, he was very disciplined in what he showed people, and so it was very clear what the iPhone was about. Out because he narrowed in on just a couple of things. Yeah, yeah, I think Buster and I talked about this last show, and it was kind of it was kind of muddled. Actually, maybe it was a couple of shows when you were on uh, ago, Leander. It was like the whole presentation felt a little bit muddled. So we just don't know what the Apple Watch is going to do. 
right. how much I, it's going to cost. We just know that how the battery is. Or... Yeah. I mean, Johnny Ive and Mark Newson were showing it off in Paris this, this week. I love the picture I saw of them standing with Carl Lagerfeld, um, famous designer. I hope I said his last name right. Who, yeah. who looks like, um, you know, like a total vampire in his like <laughs> black outfit. And he has like this really puffy, lacy uh, neck accoutrements on and his hair is all done and like pulled back and they're showing it off to all these fashion people it's going to be really interesting to me to see how they price the edition version of the watch because the thing i keep coming back to is you look at a timex or a a rolex a timex (laughs) look at a rolex (laughs) or other expensive watches and they're very intricately made with all the like the, the custom gears and everything inside and they're very elaborate you know and the Apple Watch, if they come out and say the edition, if it's going to be like ten grand, but it's ten grand for a piece of technology that's going to be outdated in a year, I just don't know how that's going to sit with people. I just I don't know if that's a strategy that's going to be successful for yeah, them. Yeah, but you're not a person that's no offense that that has just ten grand to throw around on a worthless watch in the first place. So <laughs> Dude, I think people uh... that are buying watches that cost ten grand like probably don't care. If it's going to be worthless in four years, they more care like the statement it makes now. But that's my my opinion on it. Well, let me just correct you. My bank account has many <laughs> zeros in it. It just happens. It just so happens that most of them are on the right hand side of the decimal point. So you you stand corrected, sir. Sorry, my, my apologies. <laughs> Didn't mean to insult, insult your bank account. You're right. As a man who only has $300 to his name, I don't think I'll be buying the edition of the Apple Watch. But I'm, I am curious to see how they price it because a $10,000 Apple device just seems kind of wacky to me. But again, I don't dress as well as Karl Lagerfeld and I don't drink human blood. Yeah. So, <laughs> stay and, I, and I don't love to count. One, two. <laughs> All right, guys, let's go ahead and wrap it up there. Stick around for the Steve Jobs commencement address. We're going to be broadcasting that in just a sec. Hey, go check out Very Desk. Get up off your butt cheeks and start standing during your workday. Lose some weight, feel better. Check them out at verydesk.com, V-A-R-I-D-E-S-K.com. And please be sure to enter CultCast in the How Did You Hear About Us section. That's all the CultCast we have for you guys this week. New episodes of the CultCast come out every Thursday night. I want to thank everyone for listening. And we'll see you guys next week. As usual, nothing unexpected. This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Thank you. I'm uh, honored to be with you today for your commencement from one of the finest universities in the world. Truth be told, Uh, I never graduated from college, and uh, this is the closest I've ever gotten to a college graduation. (laughs) Today, I want to tell you three stories from my life. That's it. No big deal. Just three stories. The first story is about connecting the dots. I dropped out of Reed College after the first six months, but then stayed around as a drop-in for another 18 months or so before I really quit. So why'd I drop out? It started before I was born. My biological mother was a young, unwed graduate student, and she decided to put me up for adoption. She felt very strongly that I should be adopted by college graduates, so everything was all set for me to be adopted at birth by a lawyer and his wife. Except that when I popped out, they decided at the last minute that they really wanted a girl. So my parents, who were on a waiting list, got a call in the middle of the night asking, we've got an unexpected baby boy, do you want him? 
They said, of course. My biological mother found out later that my mother had never graduated from college and that my father had never graduated from high school. She refused to sign the final adoption papers. She only relented a few months later when my parents promised that I would go to college. This was the start in my life. And 17 years later, I did go to college. But I naively chose a college that was almost as expensive as Stanford. And all of my working class parents' savings were being spent on my college tuition. After six months, I couldn't see the value in it. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and no idea how college was going to help me figure it out. And here I was, spending all of the money my parents had saved their entire life. So I decided to drop out and trust that it would all work out okay. It was pretty scary at the time, but looking back, it was one of the best decisions I ever made. <laughs> the minute I dropped out, I could stop taking the required classes that didn't interest me and begin dropping in on the ones that looked far more interesting. It wasn't all romantic. I didn't have a dorm room, so I slept on the floor in friends' rooms. I returned Coke bottles for the five cent deposits to buy food with. And I would walk the seven miles across town every Sunday night to get one good meal a week at the Hare Krishna temple. I loved it. And much of what I stumbled into by following my curiosity and intuition turned out to be priceless later on. Let me give you one example. Reed College at that time offered perhaps the best calligraphy instruction in the country. Throughout the campus, every poster, every label on every drawer was beautifully hand calligraphed. Because I had dropped out and didn't have to take the normal classes, I decided to take a calligraphy class to learn how to do this. I learned about serif and sans serif typefaces, about varying the amount of space between different letter combinations, about what makes great typography great. It was beautiful, historical, artistically subtle in a way that science can't capture, and I found it fascinating. None of this had even a hope of any practical application in my life. But 10 years later, when we were designing the first Macintosh computer, it all came back to me, and we designed it all into the Mac. It was the first computer with beautiful typography. If I had never dropped in on that single course in college, the Mac would have never had multiple typefaces or proportionally spaced fonts. And since Windows just copied the Mac, it's likely that no personal computer would have them. If I had never dropped out, I would have never dropped in on that calligraphy class, and personal computers might not have the wonderful typography that they do. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. My second story is about love and loss. I was lucky. I found what I loved to do early in life. Waz and I started Apple in my parents' garage when I was 20. We worked hard, and in 10 years, Apple had grown from just the two of us in a garage into a $2 billion company with over 4,000 employees. We just released our finest creation, the Macintosh, a year earlier, and I'd just turned 30. And then I got fired. How can you get fired from a company you started? Well, as Apple grew, we hired someone who I thought was very talented to run the company with me. And for the first year or so, things went well. But then our visions of the future began to diverge, and eventually we had a falling out. When we did, our board of directors sided with him. And so at 30, I was out, and very publicly out. What had been the focus of my entire adult life was gone, and it was devastating. I really didn't know what to do for a few months. I felt that I had let the previous generation of entrepreneurs down, that I had dropped the baton as it was being passed to me. 
I met with David Packard and Bob Noyce and tried to apologize for screwing up so badly. I was a very public failure and I even thought about running away from the valley. But something slowly began to dawn on me. I still loved what I did. The turn of events at Apple had not changed that one bit. I'd been rejected, but I was still in love. And so I decided to start over. I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. The heaviness of being successful was replaced by the lightness of being a beginner again, less sure about everything. It freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life. During the next five years, I started a company named Next, another company named Pixar, and fell in love with an amazing woman who would become my wife. Pixar went on to create the world's first computer animated feature film, Toy Story, and is now the most successful animation studio in the world. In a remarkable turn of events, Apple bought Next, and I returned to Apple, and the technology we developed at Next is at the heart of Apple's current renaissance. And Lorreen and I have a wonderful family together. I'm pretty sure none of this would have happened if I hadn't been fired from Apple. It was awful tasting medicine, but I guess the patient needed it. Sometime life, sometimes life's going to hit you in the head with a brick. Don't lose faith. I'm convinced that the only thing that kept me going was that I loved what I did. You've got to find what you love, and that is as true for work as it is for your lovers. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life, and the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking and don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. And like any great relationship, it just gets better and better as the years roll on. So keep looking, don't settle. My third story is about death. When I was 17, I read a quote that went something like, if you live each day as if it was your last, someday you'll most certainly be right. <laughs> it made an impression on me. And since then, for the past 33 years, I've looked in the mirror every morning and asked myself, if today were the last day of my life, would I want to do what I am about to do today? And whenever the answer has been no for too many days in a row, I know I need to change something. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life. Because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. There is no reason not to follow your heart. About a year ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. I had a scan at 7.30 in the morning, and it clearly showed a tumor on my pancreas. I didn't even know what a pancreas was. The doctors told me this was almost certainly a type of cancer that is incurable and that I should expect to live no longer than three to six months. My doctor advised me to go home and get my affairs in order, which is doctor's code for prepare to die. It means to try and tell your kids everything. You thought you'd have the next 10 years to tell them in just a few months. It means to make sure everything is buttoned up so that it will be as easy as possible for your family. It means to say your goodbyes. I live with that diagnosis all day. Later that evening, I had a biopsy where they stuck an endoscope down my throat, through my stomach and into my intestines, put a needle into my pancreas and got a few cells from the tumor. I was sedated, but my wife, who was there, told me that when they viewed the cells under a microscope, the doctor started crying because it turned out to be a very rare form of pancreatic cancer that is curable with surgery. I had the surgery, and thankfully, I'm fine now. <clears throat> mm. This was the closest I've been to facing death, and I hope it's the closest I get for a few more decades. Having lived through it, 
I can now say this to you with a bit more certainty than when death was a useful but purely intellectual concept. No one wants to die. Even people who want to go to heaven don't want to die to get there. And yet, <laughs> death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. And that is as it should be, because death is very likely the single best invention of life. It's life's change agent. It clears out the old to make way for the new. Right now, the new is you. But someday, not too long from now, you will gradually become the old and be cleared away. Sorry to be so dramatic, but it's quite true. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking. Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice. And most important, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. When I was young, there was an amazing publication called the Whole Earth Catalog, which was one of the Bibles of my generation. It was created by a fellow named Stuart Brand, not far from here in Menlo Park, and he brought it to life with his poetic touch. This was in the late 60s, before personal computers and desktop publishing, so it was all made with typewriters, scissors, and Polaroid cameras. It was sort of like Google in paperback form 35 years before Google came along. It was idealistic, overflowing with neat tools, and great notions. Stuart and his team put out several issues of the Whole Earth Catalog, and then, when it had run its course, they put out a final issue. It was the mid-1970s, and I was your age. On the back cover of their final issue was a photograph of an early morning country road, the kind you might find yourself hitchhiking on if you were so adventurous. Beneath it were the words, stay hungry, stay foolish. It was their farewell message as they signed off. Stay hungry, stay foolish. And I have always wished that for myself. And now, as you graduate to begin anew, I wish that for you. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thank you all very much. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.